The Raising of Lazarus, The Ten Plagues of Egypt, Walking on Water, Feeding the 5,000. There's lots of miracle stories in the scriptures that are pretty well known, even by non Christians. Most of them are done by Jesus, but Moses and Elijah, they have their fair share as well. But there's a miracle in 2 Kings 6 that's just a bit harder to categorize. It's not nearly as dramatic as the other miracles. It doesn't solve some major problem that seems something as dire as uh, parting the Red Sea to save the Israelites. And, And this miracle I want to talk about today, it can leave us scratching our heads, wondering what it's even doing in the Bible. 2 Kings 6 verses 5 through 7, it has this story of some men who were chopping down trees by a river. But as one was felling a log, his axe head fell into the water. And he cried out, Alas, my master, it was borrowed. Then the man of God said, Where did it fall? When he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. And he said, Take it up. So he reached out his hand and took it. So a man is distressed that he broke an axe. So this man of God, which is actually the prophet Elisha, he throws a stick into the water and that makes the iron axe head float back up to the surface. And it's a miracle, sure, but kind of mundane compared to the rest of them. In fact, another element of this story that I'd like to study today is that Elisha was only given a limited number of miracles to do. And this is how he chooses to use one of them. I find this to be weird, and I'd like to explore why it's in the Bible. Turn to 2 Kings 6, and let's get weird. Welcome to Weird Stuff in the Bible, where we explore scripture passages that are bizarre, perplexing, or just plain weird. This is Luke Taylor, and today we're going to be talking about the miracle of the floating axe head in 2 Kings 6. This is probably not the most pressing question on a lot of our minds as we're pondering the deep mysteries of scripture, but it is something that always stands out to me as I read through my Bible. And then there is a friend of mine at church, his name's Dustin, and he brought this passage up to me as an idea a few weeks back. And uh, it struck a chord with me because, like I said, I'm also often questioning, why is this story here? Like, what does it mean? And so let's dig into that today. And I I actually want to start with the beginning of Elisha's ministry, um, which goes back to the beginning of 2 Kings, his solo ministry. So most of you might remember that Elisha was a companion of the prophet Elijah. I'm just, I'm not always sure if like the Holy Spirit put these two guys together to to confuse us or something because their names are so similar. Um, But anyway, they were partners in ministry up until 2 Kings 2, and that's when Elijah was taken to heaven without dying. And so um, right before Elijah departed from this earth, he made an offer to his faithful companion, Elisha. He says in 2 Kings 2 verses 9 through 12, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please, let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, You have asked a hard thing. Yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. And so basically, Elisha's wish was granted. And virtually all scholars will agree, Elisha was given the grace and power to perform twice as many miracles as Elijah did. Now, as far as the specific number goes, that's where it becomes a little bit debatable. One of the two schools of thought on this are that Elijah performed seven miracles, and Elisha did 14. And then the other thought is that Elijah did eight, and Elisha did 16. And I'm not going to go through an exhaustive list of each man's miracles to kind of parse all this out. Basically, the potential eighth miracle of Elijah, it was right here, whenever he was picked up by the heavenly Uber. But it's just a little hazy to me, like, could you really consider this a miracle that Elijah did? Or was it more of something that just kind of happened to him? And then Elisha also has a couple of miracles that they're kind of ambiguous too. Like maybe they could be condensed down two into one. Roughly though, roughly speaking, generally speaking, it could accurately be said 
that Elisha performed twice as many miracles as Elijah did. Now, Elisha's miracles were not usually as big and flashy as Elijah's miracles. Elisha was kind of like the movie sequel that it's supposed to outdo the first one, but they don't give it as big of a budget for special effects. And so even though Elisha did more, he's not as famous or well-known as Elijah is. And so here's why I started today by making that point. Elisha knows that there are a limited number of miraculous works that he's going to be able to do. Okay, whether it's 14 or 16, basically, it's not unlimited power. And so I'm just a little surprised that he uses one of them here for the the kind of mundane task of locating a broken axe head. I mean, I'm going to admit in those days, replacing a broken axe head, it's not as simple as driving down to Lowe's and buying one for $20 or $19.50 with your Lowe's Advantage card. Things weren't mass produced back then. It took a little bit more time and craftsmanship to construct tools. And um, but on the other hand, it's not like it was an impossible thing to do either. And so why of all the miracles that Elisha was going to be allowed to perform? Why did he use one of them for this? You know, I think of it kind of like the analogy of being granted a genie with three wishes. You know, maybe you've thought about this before. If you had three wishes, you could receive whatever your heart desired. What would you wish for? I think most of us would probably use our three wishes for something big. Saving the life of someone we loved, fixing one of the major problems in the world, getting our dream job, a second season of Firefly. You know, if you were to use one of your precious three wishes for something like the Lord of the Rings box set in 4K resolution, that would be considered a waste of a wish. I mean, it's something that anybody with a hundred bucks could drive down to Target and buy it any day of the week. It's not something that you would use one of your only three wishes on. Although it would make a great Christmas gift, just saying. So Elisha is going to be granted the ability to to do a bit more than three miracles. But there is a significant limitation here on how many he's going to be able to do. So how does he decide to use one of his miracles right here in 2 Kings 6? Well, let's read the whole story and try to get a gist of the context. 2 Kings 6 verses 1 and 2. Now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See, The place where we dwell under your charge is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan, and each of us get there a log, and let us make a place for us to dwell there. And he answered, Go. Well, let's talk about who the sons of the prophets were real quick. Um, There's kind of an interesting thing going on in Israel. During the days of Elijah and then Elisha, there were these two groups of prophets. There were the true prophets and the false prophets. The true prophets, of course, follow God. It's unknown how many of them there were. Uh, uh, 1 Kings 18, it mentions that there were about 100 of them that were being hidden by Obadiah. Then you also have the false prophets. Those are the ones who, you know, they would just tell the king whatever he wanted to hear. Uh, 1 Kings 22 mentioned 400s of those. Then there were false prophets who would try to get Israel to follow false gods. 1 Kings 18, it mentioned at least 850 of those. So the true prophets, they were far outnumbered and even seemed to be oppressed in comparison with the false prophets. And so here in this story, some of the true prophets are saying to Elijah, or Elisha, (laughs) there I go again, they're saying to Elisha, they're saying, hey, the ministry's growing. Wouldn't it be a great idea if we just built ourselves a house and that's a place we could all have to live in and study the things of God and band together and we'd probably be more effective? And and so Elisha's like, yeah, go for it. Great idea. So verses three and four. And then one of them said, be pleased to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. So they've requested that Elisha would come along with them. And they get started on chopping down the trees for the house. And it's a good thing they brought him along because here's what happens next. Verse five. But as one was felling a log, his axe head fell into the water. And he cried out, Alas, my master, it was borrowed. So his distress is rooted in the fact that not only did he lose an axe head, but that he had borrowed someone else's axe. And so basically he had broken someone else's tool. Now, again, we can look at this as a major bummer, I guess. Kind of a bummer. I I don't even know if we call it major. It's not something that would be the end of the world. Okay. I mean, we can put ourselves in this guy's shoes. We can sympathize with his frustration. 
Here he is trying to do something for God. He's trying to build a school for the prophets. He hasn't gone into this half-cocked. I mean, he got the, the blessing of his leadership over his life. He went to the man of God of their time, Elisha. Elisha has given them the go-ahead. So he's gotten approval through all the right channels. He's doing work for God. He's doing it in God's way. You would imagine that God's got his hand on the process. And then right off the bat, something goes wrong. And I can relate with that. You know, the frustration of trying to do something for God, getting your leader's blessing to pursue it, and then whenever you put your hand to the task, immediately stuff starts going wrong. I can understand that (laughs) completely. So this guy, he's chopping away with his friend's axe. Maybe all the other guys had their own axe, but he didn't, so he had to borrow one. And then of all the axes that break that day, guess whose it is? So I could imagine this guy's exasperation, maybe even confusion at this turn of events. Verses six and seven. Then the man of God said, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. And he said, take it up. So he reached out his hand and took it. So first, Elisha, he asks where it is. And I've heard it said, um, and it, it certainly looks this way in some of the pictures I've seen. The Jordan River is kind of a muddy river. Uh, not that it's necessarily brown. It's just kind of murky. It's not, it's not clear water that you can see through to the bottom. And so then Elisha, he does a strange thing. He throws another stick into the water where the axe head landed. And somehow this causes the iron axe head to rise up to the surface. I mean, I say somehow. Clearly, it's a miracle. Okay, the iron head floats like a rubber ducky. The prophet picks it up, and now they can fix the broken axe and get back to work. And that's all there is to the story. Verse 8 is going to go on to talk about something totally different. And this little brief episode, it's never referenced again anywhere else in the Bible. There would be nothing of note about this story at all, other than that it's one of the 14 or 16 miracles of Elisha. So what can we take away from this little episode? Well, the story and its details, that they're so mundane on their own that commentators have a little fun with this story. And I'm not here to say that they're wrong. I, I'm, I'm a little skeptical of some of these interpretations, but uh, I'll start with J. Vernon McGee. He likens this to a demonstration of the gospel. He says the axe is like a man, which has fallen. Part of it breaks off and falls to the bottom of the water, useless, total depravity. And then Elisha throws a stick into the water, and this wooden stick represents the wooden cross of Christ, and this causes new life to enter that sunken man, and he rises through that dirty water up to the surface. And all this represents new life in Christ and being washed clean from your sins. Then there's another interpretation of this I saw from John Corson, and I found this one a little bit more interesting. So he has it where the axe head represents the Holy Spirit, and the wood of the axe handle represents the flesh. And so this man lost the anointing of the Holy Spirit when he lost the axe head. And so he knew that his ministry would be ineffective. And that's when he that's when he shouted, it was borrowed. He was acknowledging that the Holy Spirit's power in his life was not something that he could generate, but that it was, it was something that didn't belong to him. And so John Corson says that when the fresh stick was cast toward the axe head, that was for a renewed partnership of the, of the spirit with the flesh. And the axe head came back to the wooden stick, and this represented the return of the Holy Spirit to our lives. And so John Corson, he was connecting this. I mean, he believed this literally happened, but he also kind of allegorizes it to get a meaning out of it, that it, it's the, the same as the concept where we can grieve the Holy Spirit in our day, um, how we can cause his anointing to depart from us. I'm not saying to lose your salvation. It's just whenever you cause the Holy Spirit's presence in your life to diminish, because of sin or because of getting lazy in our spiritual walk or whatever. And um, I like John Corson's interpretation a little bit more, but, you know, neither of these ideas, neither of these really satisfied what I took away from the story as I read it. And so I'm going to give you my interpretation of why this weird little miracle is in the Bible right after this short break. Let's talk real quick about what's coming next on the podcast. Uh, As I was working on this lesson, 
I realized that there's a couple more weird things in the Bible that I've been wanting to talk about on this podcast, and they, they actually appear right here in this very chapter of the Bible. And so for the next couple episodes, I just want to take the, really, I just want to go straight from here to the next verses directly after this in the story that we just read and, and just keep talking about this weird prophet, Elisha. And uh, so join us next time. He's, he's going to use his next miracle to find his lost car in the parking lot at Food for Less. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, hey, Dustin, thanks for that uh, suggestion today. And um, thanks for giving me some fuel for the next couple episodes here. And also a shout out to his wife, Elena, because she acknowledges me as a weirdo every time I see her at church. And so th- thank you, Elena. I, I feel seen. That's how it makes me feel. It makes me feel seen <laughs> when I get called a weirdo. Um, hey, guys, I also want you to know that I'm really excited about what's ahead in the month of October. So next month is actually going to be the one year anniversary of this podcast. So I, I, I'm i blown away by the support of everyone who's uh, listened and reached out with um, compliments or, or suggestions for the podcast. And so thank you to everyone for your feedback. And uh, for the one year anniversary of the podcast, I've got a few exciting interviews lined up that I'm looking forward to sharing with you. Um, I'm going to try to release those next month here. So they're going to deal heavily with the subjects of the supernatural realm. And uh, and I, I just tell you what, I wouldn't have had the courage to reach out to these people for, for their time to do interviews with me if I just didn't feel like I had the listenership to, to make it worth their while. And so to all of you who listen, I just want to say thanks for being a subscriber. And, and if you're not subscribed, if you're just listening today but not subscribed, make sure you do get subscribed so that you can hear some of these interviews that are that are coming out here in the next month. Uh, in closing today, I just want to give my thoughts on this passage that we've been looking at in 2 Kings 6 and what it really meant to me as I was studying it. And, um, you know, I'm thankful uh, that for the commentaries I had that gave some of these allegorical interpretations that, um, you know, I don't necessarily ag- ag- go all the way with them, but, um, you know, that I understand, I understand where they're coming from. Some of the commentaries I looked at also had the same thought that I had had as I dug into them. Um, what I got out of this passage was the love and concern that God shows even for the small matters in life. And, and there's some issues that they seem so small that I honestly don't even bother to always pray about them. You know, if I'm stuck in traffic and running late to an appointment, I probably won't think to pray for green lights ahead. If I ever lost my keys... I probably wouldn't pray to find them if if I thought I was going to find them on my own in the next couple minutes. If I broke my wheelbarrow while doing yard work, I'm probably not going to consider praying for a divine healing on my gardening tool. You know, those kind of situations, they seem so earthly, so common, so non-spiritual, that it just wouldn't be my natural response to look for a spiritual solution. And yet this brief little passage in 2 Kings 6 It reminds me that God cares about the little day-to-day issues of life. We've already established this guy's axe head being lost. Yeah, it was a bummer. This wasn't going to cause Bonnie Tyler to belt out a chorus about how she needs a hero. Yes, he was upset that his axe was broken. And his emotions were a little heightened by the fact that he had borrowed someone's axe. And so now he had some explaining to do. But this was far from a life or death situation. and yet. Elisha used one of his miracles to retrieve this lost item. And I don't believe Elisha could have done it if it wasn't something that God was empowering him to do. And so this story reminds me of the fact that God cares about the smaller issues in life and that whenever we bring them before him in prayer, he'll answer those prayers too. There is nothing too small for God. God cares about everything. And that means the things on the macro level, and the things on the micro level. And that also means everything in between. In fact, it was hard not to compare this to another much more famous miracle that Jesus did, the time that he turned water into wine. If you think about it, that was also not a life or death situation. Yes, it would have been embarrassing to run out of wine so early in the wedding at Cana. And yes, that was more of a shame and honor culture back then. So that would have heightened the emotions of the family. But you can't tell me that it was going to have ruined anybody's life if they ran out of the wine. It would have been a social faux pas. It would have meant the end of the party, but not the end of the world. And yet, Jesus performs a miracle to save this event from disaster. 
And not only that, John 2.11 tells us that this, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. So this wasn't just a miracle. This was his first miracle. You might say that this was his inaugural event as the Son of God. And we place a lot of significance on the first of something. The first speech a candidate makes when running for office. The first sermon a pastor preaches whenever he takes a church. The first time your little boy can use the bathroom on his own without needing my help. I haven't experienced that last one yet, but I'm sure that's going to be a very significant first whenever we finally get there. Well, Jesus is about to embark on a ministry of massive miracles, raising people from the dead, cleansing lepers of their leprosy, opening blind eyes, paralytics getting up and walking. When Jesus does a miracle, it's typically because someone's life situation has gotten pretty desperate. And yet, for his first miracle ever, Jesus turns water into wine to save a new young couple from some embarrassment. And yet, through that, we see that God cares about the smaller things in our lives, too. The situations that aren't necessarily life and death. They can be as small as a broken axe, but we can still bring them before the Father. And sometimes you might be surprised at what He'll do. So I encourage you today to take everything before the Lord of heaven and earth. Not just the big things, but to regard nothing that's troubling you today as too small to not be worth his attention. And if talking to God about all the big and small things that you're dealing with today sounds weird, I hope you'll be a little more weird today too. Thanks for listening. God bless you for sticking around till the end. And we'll see you next time on Weird Stuff in the Bible.